Let me just uh, start with a collection of very improbables that led to this, this search happening. First of all, in 2006, there were four World War uh, submarines, World War II submarines that were, were found. Uh, that's the fourth. Uh, and the, the likelihood of that is, is uh, increased by certain technological things. The internet obviously made an immense amount of this possible. And they were all found by civilians. This is my dad, uh, who was the commander of the sub. Uh, this is Tiverton, Rhode Island, just across the Sconnet River. Uh, I'm sitting on the chair there next to my dad. And uh, this is a picture of all the sailors and the wives. So we have pictures of the, of the crew. And part of this whole project was finding relatives of every single member of the crew. This was the famous regret to inform you telegram. And my brother Brad, he's the middle brother who just died in, in May, uh, did a lot of research trying to find out what happened, but getting kind of stonewalled all along the way, uh, talking to various Navy people, talking to various uh, people in the area in, in Alaska where uh, we assumed it was. But basically the search zone was about 20,000 square miles based on the information we had. Not a, not a terribly good way to start. But this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Richard M. Lane, from Colorado was a hobbyist, historical World War II buff, and he bought uh, a wiring diagram that belonged to a Japanese freighter. It turns out that that freighter was the Kano Maru, which turns out to have been involved in a confrontation with a submarine in World War II. And we found that out because uh, this gentleman was involved in a, uh, uh, a sort of a chat room uh, on the internet of uh, hobbyists from World War II, and there are a number of Japanese people. And uh, this gentleman here, named Yutaka Iwasaki, was also a hobbyist, worked for the Japanese Navy as a translator, and had translated an article written in an obscure Japanese maritime journal that talked about this battle. But it never got into the official records because this was the merchant marine rather than the official navy, and they always looked down on them, so that's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, I uh, was able to get his email, and I sent him a note, and I said, I am the son of this commander, and uh, we were wondering if uh, you were the person who translated this article. And he wrote back saying, it was him and uh, I pray for the repose of your father's soul. And he sent us copies of this article, and almost like a, a newspaper rather than a magazine, uh, and this is the ship, and that ship uh, had been torpedoed. It's uh, beached uh, in a harbor on the island of Kiska. And uh, this is uh, a diagram of, uh, that the, the captain of that ship put together in his logbook that shows how uh, the, uh, uh, the Grunion, that's the G1234, showing the different time periods when uh, the ships are moving. Uh, a total of six torpedoes were shot, only one went off. Several of them bounced off the side of the uh, cargo ship. Not a, not a very exciting thing if you're the captain, because it leaves a little steam trail, so it tells you exactly uh, where you are. And uh, it was an armed freighter, and uh, they, they shot back. And as it said in the video segment, it was 84 shots. And the 84th one hit something, but it couldn't possibly have sunk a submarine. It had to be more than that. Now, just an idea. Kiska is, is further away from Anchorage, Alaska, than New York is from Miami. Uh, it is closer to Sakhalin Island just to the west there than it is to the mainland Alaska. Uh, Sakhalin Island is, is part of Russia. So it is in a remote area of the world. Well, after a meeting uh, only on the, the internet, uh, Yutaka uh, from Japan in 2002, uh, my brothers and I are very excited. We thought we had sort of discovered the answer of what happened. But there were a lot of other questions that kept coming up. And later on, I met uh, Bob Ballard and uh, invited him over to, actually, to Boston Scientific, where he is here. And we talked about 
uh, the process of finding uh, a target under the, under the ocean. And uh, what we did is uh, I found out that Bob was not going to be available to do this trip. He had another project going on. So what I did is I hired a crab boat, just like they you, uh, use in that, what's the name of the uh, video uh, television program? Yeah. And, and uh, anyway, same, same crab boat, and it's a rough place. But you can see it has cranes on it, so that uh, that becomes a very useful thing if you're trying to do an underwater search. Uh, that's one of the cranes lifting, uh, this is in 2006, uh, a side scan sonar, which allows us to go down and search the bottom in both directions. And you can see quite a ways, but you have to have a bottom that's fairly flat. If there are big bumps in it, then it's going to get shadowed and you won't be able to see very far. But it turns out uh, in August of 2006, we did come across actually several targets. Uh, and this is a, a picture of the sonar gram. And in the center, you see a little bit of a black dot. And they said, well, that, that's a target worth looking at. So they got closer. And there it is in the lower right. Uh, and we got even closer. And you can see what l could be a ship. It certainly doesn't look very much like a submarine. But it was encouraging that we had something that we could go after. Now, where it's sort of squiggly down at the bottom, that's an artifact. The, the side scan uh, sonar is being towed way below the boat, almost uh, two or 3,000 feet below. And uh, when they go up and down, it's on a winch. When they move it up and down, it can create that uh, artifact. They don't want to tow it into a rock because it's a million dollar vehicle. Uh, then later on, what we did is worked with somebody to actually uh, put all these uh, sonargrams together. And you can see up at the top is the, the target that we called the grunion at that point. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see a slide trail. It's sort of a, a circular thing that goes to the right and comes back in. And uh, it's pretty hard to identify these, but it sort of looked like uh, it landed uh, down uh, on the lower left of the slide and slid something like three quarters of a mile down the side of this volcano. You have to understand the Aleutians are in fact part of the Pacific Rim of Fire, lots of volcanoes. And the Kiska volcano had actually erupted three times since 1942, so we were concerned whether in fact uh, it had been covered up. There was also one Richter scale nine earthquake uh, which could have also caused a dislodging. So uh, we didn't know, but we did have a target, and we went to pursue it. That's actually the, the team. Uh, David Gallo is the guy on the right, uh, uh, on wearing the red shirt on the right. Uh, and there's a picture uh, of the uh, Aquila, which is the crab boat in Kiska Harbor. Uh, there's a picture from the hill in Kiska. It's, it's a fascinating place. It is kind of a Lord of the Rings type environment. Uh, no trees, uh, but the, the Japanese uh, occupied uh, Kiska in World War II for 13 months until we took them off. If you had sort of sailed out there, you might have said, gee, why didn't we just give them to them? But uh, uh, we didn't do that. The island hasn't changed much since World War II. Here's a mini-sub, Japanese mini-sub. There were lots of guns that, in placements that were left there. It was an unfriendly place. When you, drew, when you got assigned to Kiska, you drew a short straw. Uh, one of the days we were there, the winds were blowing 90 miles an hour. So it's, it's weird weather. Uh, but in fact, uh, one of the evenings, now th this is, by the way, there were two trips. One was with a sonar, and another one was coming back with this device, which is an ROV, which has lots of cameras uh, on it. And we have to lower it with a crane into the water, and there's a long, we, we could lower it literally two miles into the water uh, if we wanted to. And you can see a lot of cameras on it, five of them in all, uh, and very, very intense lighting. Uh, and then on the boat, there was a little uh, ROV shack where all the input came in. Uh, this device also had a little sonar, short range sonar. So uh, as we're driving around, we can see beyond the distance that we can see with the cameras. 
Uh, one of the fascinating things uh, about this was this collection of people that helped us out uh, who were from all over the world, from Israel, from, from Australia, from Brazil, as well as many in the, in the US. And these were just hobbyists, but they had information that they could provide us. And one of them was an artist. And he created several drawings that show the collection of the images that we took. We basically uh, took three hours of uh, video and uh, by the way, this is what a submarine looks like, torpedoes in the front, engines in the back. Uh, and here are the actual pictures that we took down below there. There's a picture of the stern and the uh, same stern uh, when it was built, which was one of the things that made us, uh, convinced us that this was the USS Grunion. Uh, and there are various pictures where the different people had helped us uh, identify. And then going on at the same time, three of the relatives, uh, ladies, got together to find literally relatives of every last sailor on board, which is pretty amazing when you have somebody in World War II whose name was Sullivan in New York City. But in fact, they found him. And it, this is an example. It took almost a year to found, find this gentleman and involved calling everybody with the same name in that city. And in addition to that, uh, these ladies got articles published in uh, over a hundred journals so that every single uh, individual had a story written about them. That was the, the memorial aspect that, that took place. And then uh, USA Today actually put all that together with all the, the pictures and uh, has a website that uh, shows the story behind every uh, sailor. And then, most incredible, we found the bell that went with this submarine in Greenville, Mississippi. <laughs> now, uh, how we did that, uh, I, I, I can't go into, it takes too long, but it is uh, an amazing story. They're my brothers, and uh, just this past weekend, we had a memorial service in Cleveland on the USS Cod for over 200 relatives who came, and we were able to show them uh, the fact that our, our mother wrote letters to every single relative uh, of the uh, sailors at the time she knew they were lost. Uh, and that led to correspondence that we were able to collect. So it was uh, really sort of an amazing experience. There is the bell, which we took from uh, Greenville, Mississippi. I'm going to take it back in a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's being told uh, uh, for those uh, sailors. And there's the Kiska Volcano. That's the story. Thanks.